Having objective measures of athlete readiness is crucial to understanding the athlete load response cycle, but it's not without its challenges. Objective measure of muscle fatigue has long been missing in our monitoring process. And that's why I'm genuinely intrigued by myosin's technology. Myosin provides a quick, simple and direct measure of muscle fatigue through electrical stimulation of the muscle. And today we're going to look at the science behind this technology. And then we are joined by Yao Ribeiro, who is the sports scientist at SC Braga. And he's shared his experiences of using the technology in his football club. My name is Joe Club. I'm a sports science consultant and founder of Global Performance Insights, which supports sports teams, organizations, practitioners, and sports tech companies all around the world with sports science insights. So let's start by breaking down fatigue. Now, fatigue is a complex physiological problem, but put most simply, we can think of it as central fatigue and peripheral fatigue. Peripheral fatigue then breaks down further into short-term and long-term, with short-term being this metabolic fatigue response that tends to be restored within about an hour or so after intense exercise, compared then to this long-term peripheral fatigue, which is due to impaired calcium release. And this tends to last over several days. So we have our standard muscle force frequency relationship, which is this sigmoid curve shape. Now, when a muscle is fatigued, this curve shifts to the right. And given this sigmoid curve shape, this means that the slope more significantly affects the difference between rested and fatigued muscle at lower frequencies than higher frequencies. So if we are able to fix the frequency of nerve impulses through a stimulator, for example, then we observe less force in the fatigued condition at the same frequency than in the rested muscle. But as I mentioned, this difference in force output is more notable at lower frequencies than higher frequencies. And that's why this is commonly referred to as low frequency fatigue. And as I mentioned then, the difference in force output between the rested and fatigued muscle is greater at the lower frequencies. And it's this low frequency fatigue that myosin is objectively measuring and trying to leverage to understand muscle fatigue. Its technology measures force output at these fixed frequencies to establish a ratio in muscle fatigue index that they refer to as their power depth score which is measuring the ratio of low to high frequency forces. Practically speaking, the technology involves the athlete sitting with their leg in a custom developed myosensor with electrodes across the quad. They use the quad because that is a key muscle in athletic performance and therefore is a good location for trying to quantify objectively muscle fatigue. The device then runs a pre-programmed electrical stimulation capturing 48 measures over two minutes on each leg. Now, Myosin have designed this technology with applied practice in mind. Their goal was to bring the lab to the field. So it is quick, simple, non-exhaustive, non-fatiguing, and it's also portable. Crucially, it doesn't rely on efforts or motivation. And that's one of the criticisms that we see of some of our other measures. Anytime we're asking an athlete the day or two days after a game, carry out a maximum effort, we often see that they don't do so. Now, that in itself could be telling because they are not wanting to push themselves. But this technology is interesting because it takes out athlete motivation from the testing process altogether. It's always interesting, of course, to hear from practitioners who have used such technology in the day to day to understand how it may integrate into the real world. And so now we're going to hear from Jao Ribeiro, sports scientist with Braga, about his experiences of using the myosin technology. So I'm joined by Jao Ribeiro, who is the sports scientist at SD Braga in Liga Portugal. Jao, thank you for joining us today and sharing your experience with using myosin technology. How long have you been using the tech in your setting? Thank you, Joe, for the invitation. It's a pleasure being here with you, sharing this information. 
Okay, we've been using it for uh, one year almost, one year and some months. We start in the pre-season of last season and we are still using uh, until now the, the device. And what initially made you invest in that technology? Why was that deemed a worthwhile investment or addition by yourself and your colleagues and your team? Because we wanted to test and we try a lot of times to test the fatigue to make decisions on that, especially in the, in the congestive period. We use the traditional test, the neuromuscular performance test, which is very difficult to apply in a, in a practical setting because especially that the, they depend a lot on the motivation of the subjects to do, to do the tests. And uh, especially in congestive periods that we have a lot of games, is, is difficult to apply. So then we, we knew about the myosin, that is a, an instrument that does not depend on the motivation of the subject to test uh, their fatigue. And uh, that's why we, we wanted to try it and to introduce it as a, as a measure in the club. So that was the, the main reason to test fatigue, especially in congested periods, objectively, not depending on the performance test or, or subjective measurements. That's what really interests me as well about this technology. It's giving us something different, potentially. The fact that it doesn't yeah. rely on motivation and effort and gives you that objective information on fatigue, therefore potentially readiness is really interesting. How do you then integrate it within those other tests? Has it, has it replaced? jump testing or sprint bike or running tests, or is it still being used alongside other tests? No, in fact, we have replaced it, that test. So we use the myon scene in combination with other measurements, objective, wellness, RP, color scales, and, uh, and also with the biochemical markers. But we, we replaced completely the, the performance tests. In, in the congested periods, we still use the performance tests, but the diluted during the week in a uh, non congested period. We still are using this, this test, but in that specific uh, periods, we replaced completely the, the neural performance test. Interesting. And so can you describe around the protocol of how you're using it in within the week, what kind of day in the periodization, how long okay. the protocol take, et cetera? Okay. So firstly, we try it because we don't have the opportunity to test every day. I think the instrument is is good. I mean, it's still better if we use it in a in a repeated way. But uh, okay, in in a professional team, it's not always possible. So at the beginning, we try to establish the baseline the values for each player to understand. Okay, when they are not under fatigue, what are their best values? So during the preseason, we try to measure several times to to obtain the the, the baseline values, and then we start measuring in the congested periods. We decided to use it in match day uh, plus one because it's easier to apply when they are recovering. So we have yeah. some time scheduled to, to use it. And we compare directly the baseline and the value that they obtain in these congested periods. And then in the match day plus two, we combine the myosin data with other measurements like subjective and biochemical markers to decide if the player is able to train or he need to rest a little bit more in this specific day. We also measure in the, in the academy that is easy to, to apply. And we also try to measure during the week to see the, the kinetics of recovery or performance during a, a typical microcycle. But in the 18, we use the team specifically in match day plus one. And so then how long does that kind of take you to get through all the players on match day plus one? Uh, okay, because in match day plus one, we measure it only in the players that were starters. Okay, that okay. play more than your than one forty five minutes, for instance. So it's easy to apply. We normally we have eight nine players or or ten if they they play the full game. Uh, but normally don't use it in the goalkeepers. It takes two minutes for each leg, four minutes for player five to change. So we can we can we can do it uh, very very fast. How have the players been? Have they have the players bought into it? Have there been the usual discussions and debates with the players about? about what it does? Yeah, at the beginning, they were very curious about the, um, the instrument. In the preseason, they have done it very well without, without problems. Mm -hmm. During the congested periods, I think we have 80% uh, of buy-in. It depends on the game, if the game was good for them or not, if the, the, the final score was also good. They, sometimes they are not willing to do it uh, because of these contextual factors. And some of them, not all, 
because there is a uh, electrical stimulation, they also find a little bit of discomfort and they, they, they prefer not to do it. And we have to manage with that. But, uh, yeah, most of the players do it without problems, yeah. but I would say that the compliance is much higher for sure. And so you mentioned about the decisions then that are made based on this, uh, data along with the other information with the biomarkers and the subjective information. So can you talk a little about how this data is, becomes part of your performance star decision-making on match day plus two and plus three? Since we are doing only in the, uh, the professional team in match day plus one, normally they, they have a, a recovery session in match day plus one in congested periods. And then in match day plus two, we need to decide if the player is going to, to back to join with the team or to recover a little bit more. So that's why we, 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 we use the myosin data from previous day, match day plus one, and then we combine with subjective measurement and biochemical markers to decide if the player is going to, um, to train or not specifically, specifically in, in, in that day. That is the protocol that we are using. But for instance, in, in the academy, we noticed that, uh, when we try to characterize the microcycle, uh, compare with the baseline, we noticed that for instance, uh, since we, we, we measure all days of the microcycle, we were able to observe that in the match day, the players, most of them were not completely fully recovered compared to the baseline value. So we are able to talk with the, the sports science to this, to, to talk with the coach to say, okay, something has to be done really regarding the, the training load because they are not getting the match day that's fully recovered. So and we, we can change something about that. That was the decisions that we have taken. So now we, in the team, we, we have done it several times in match that was, was two. And in the academy, we have done this uh, pilot study. We can say like that to, yeah. to characterize the training role of the week. And we noticed that, that, uh, maybe match day minus one or minus two should be a little bit lighter to get the place completely recovered in the match day. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing because again, I think that's what's intriguing here is to objectively understand that balance between training and recovery and have better information to go on in terms of whether the training is too much, whether players need more recovery and you are able to provide evidence to support your recommendations. Yes, exactly. Especially if you use it in a, in a very basis, if you are able to do it, it's it's much, much better to have good information and, 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 and to make the best decisions, of course. And are there any new or, or future applications that you hope to use myosine with? Is it just a case of trying to collect more data or are there specific things you have in mind for using it in the future? Yes. During this season, we have, we have also the opportunity to test, um, you know, in a, in a group of the uh, academy of players, we wanted to test to, to, to observe the recovery, the, the, kin the kinetics, the recovery kinetics after the game. So when before we also analyzed before the game. So the protocol was, we, we analyzed the uh, pre-match and then we used the myosin, uh, okay, pre-match just after the game and 24 hours and 48 hours, we are able to follow the players in this, in this scenario. And we have observed that, okay, after the match, we, we, we really observe a decrease in the myosin battles, but then in 24 hours, they recover very fast. And then we can see again, a drawback or they are going down in, uh, again in 48 hours, in the next 48 hours, so, which is very strange for us. But uh, according to that, maybe we are going to change this season in Christmas periods. Maybe we are going to change from match day plus one to match, play, uh, match day plus two. So in okay. congested periods, in the team, we, we are going to change because we observed that at 48 hours, they are still recovering. And sometimes mm -hmm. at 48 hours, they were all, 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 almost recovered. So this will guide our, our decision uh, to, to use my scene in, in match day plus two. And according to the previous information that we observed that certain players in the academy were not at their full uh, complete recovery in match day, we wanted to analyze if possible in, in match day plus one uh, in the A team as well to make decisions on that, to adapt the load to, uh, and to observe if they are completely recovered or 
to face the, the match. Yeah, I really like that. Obviously, yeah, that's an example then of using the data you've collected to guide your processes yeah. and to make changes based on empirical evidence. Unsurprisingly, it sounds like you see quite wide variation um, between different individuals in their recoveries. Players recover at different uh, rates. This information is allowing you to quantify that. It'd be really interesting as well, I think, to compare that, potentially correlate that with the game outputs for each player, the match demands, because we know there's such variation as well between athletes game to game, even within exactly. athletes, depending on how demanding their role, and their involvement was in each game to then see how this aligns, this recovery information aligns with that load. Yes, that will be perfect. <laughs> That's the goal. That is the goal. That's the goal, exactly. Um, I think in the academy, it's quite easy. When we use young players, it's quite easy to do it or in academy place because they are very willing to test and they are uh, they have a schedule that is possible to do it in the team we need to choose specific specifically the days we want to test because you know yes. we have a time schedule to do it we have other activities so that's why we are trying to find the best solution with uh, the minimal testing but the, the, the very best information exactly yes i always talk about maximizing value and minimizing burden on the athletes. Exactly. Exactly. So that's exactly the same. And although you're doing more testing with the academy, it's improving your practice, making it more efficient then at the, the senior A team level, exactly. but then with them as well, it will, it will adjust how you test with them as well. What about then the application? You're just using it, you know, one measure a day to make the decision before training. But there's another application where you measure pre and post to understand training. Yes, that is one feature that we can uh, we can use with myosin. If we test the pre and post uh, training sessions, we can have the the consequence. We can say like that uh, of the training load applied in in that training session, and uh, we can have it almost in real time. After the we finish the training session, we can we can uh, measure the fatigue, and that will give us information for the next training session uh, to okay to 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 make an update or a modification in the training world according to the data that we have previously in the, in, with my scene it's uh, an acute way we can say that to to analyze the, the acute fatigue of the, the training session you're a year in and you you're going into this season with the technology as well i suppose then um You've provided various details about how you use myosin and how it has helped you. How would you summarize your experience so far with the technology? Okay. Um, since the, 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 the primary goal was to obtain a test that is not dependent on the willing of the, the subjects, uh, that was very good for us. We are able to test it. Um, we have a small uh, issue with the uh, with the buy-in, as any other test. Even the subjective measures uh, is not always one hundred percent. We don't have one hundred percent buy-in, so we still have the uh, small issue. But uh, since it's a very practical uh, instrument, we can we can use it everywhere, which is very good. We can transport the the, the instrument to the academy, to the A team, to the the training camps. So that is a very good point, and uh, due to that, due to that, I think is a is a, a test that we still want to to use, and uh, for sure will be a routine for us for our decisions. So the experience has has been very good, and we want to to optimize a little bit more the the mm -hmm. protocols. Well, Jao, thank you very much for um, sharing that. Really interesting to not just hear about the science, but hear from a practitioner who's using it day to day about the applications that you're using it for. So thank you very much for sharing with us. Thank you again for the, the invitation. It was a pleasure to, to, to share the information with you.